nice time to come to the Lord. Make a commitment. Give him your life again. Let me tell you, the greatest investment anyone could make is to give their lives to Christ. No greater investment. Greatest joy, and you can only, you'll only see this retrospectively. The greatest joy you can find in life is to look back on your lives and realize how good that God has been despite sometimes our shortcomings. And, um, just let him be who he has to be in your lives. I said this yesterday at the seminar, and I want to say it again. It's not part of my sermon, but I just feel I need to say these things. You know, just do your sums right. Even if you don't, have, don't understand the Bible or you can't read it the way you should, you've not been trained, you know, in the scriptures. But common sense. Just ask God for common sense. Something that sometimes I think a lot of people have degrees and a lot of intellect, but sometimes they lack common sense. Just making simple, easy decisions. And sometimes we just have to be streetwise spiritually streetwise and just learn one thing don't fight God don't question anything don't argue with him just trust him just put your life in his hands and see how, he'll, how he will take care of you sometimes we become too calculative too we measure too many things we argue and reason over so many things we you know we Adopt this pedantic approach to life. We miss out on the greater things of God. It takes the mind of a child to inherit the kingdom of God. And the greatest stumbling block is that sometimes we want to think like individuals that are so caught up in ourselves and our opinions of life that we miss the simplicity of the life that is in Christ, the life of faith. And faith demands childlikeness. And, and sometimes we have to become fools for Christ to enjoy the blessings that come with Christ. Are you understanding me? It's called death to self. And I pray to God today that, that no matter how sophisticated and complicated our lives become, we will not complicate, uncomplicated spiritual things. The Bible is simple. Just trust Him. Trust Him. No matter what you go, even if you're in hell right now in Hades, in the pit of despair and darkness, put your trust in Him. He'll be with you. You will never walk alone. Amen? <laughs> There's nothing like, power, like prayer. It's nothing like spending time in fasting and prayer. Um, it's a discipline that the early church understood, and uh, they gave themselves uh, to much fastings and prayers. And we need to learn how to, in the sophistry of our present walk in Christ. You know, the church has developed in its, in its understanding of revelation and reading of the scriptures sometimes we get so good at what we, we we become that we leave the simple basics the basic things the fundamentals and fasting and prayer is part of it and, and we have to learn how to do this every every week every month every you know every period of the year and uh, in this church on a Wednesday is a day dedicated to fasting whether we announce it or not that's the day Sometimes you can't make it, sometimes it's not possible, but if you can't fast once a week, it's a Wednesday. And the type of fasting that we encourage in this church is abstinence from food, abstinence from food. And for our wellness, you can do that. But when you're really fasting, according to the Bible, it is to abstain from food and you can drink water. You can drink water. Um, 
fruit juices are not encouraged. There's enough energy in it. Uh, so learn how to do it the right way. And if your doctor advises you otherwise, then follow some of that advice also. We don't want any people to go in a coma now. All right, but, um, but please, uh, let's do it right. Let's do it right. Sometimes if you can't do it a whole day, fast for half a day. But get the discipline. Believe me, fasting will bring healing to you. Bring healing and deliverance in multiple ways. And, and do something that is a practical part of fasting. Um, take the, that money that you would have used for bread that day and buy maybe a loaf of bread for somebody or, or give a meal or, or what you would cook to the poor or do something. Share with somebody that lacks. Uh, become, become charitable even in your fast. And it's a good time to remember your own people, your neighbors, your, your family, your friends, and make your peace with them. The demonstrative side uh, of the administration of fasting is something that people neglect. They fast a lot, uh, but they don't want to make their peace with enemies and so forth. So let's, let's read chapters like Isaiah 58 and get all the, the lessons we can from there. I'm saying this because on a Sunday, some of you may not have come to the seminar, but you'd like to get the information you can't get uh, here. And let's do it the right way. The right way. Say to your neighbor, the right way. Okay, and we're talking about a biblically correct way. Um, so, when the Bible does say that they met from house to house, it's not meaning that the church has to meet literally in residential units. It literally means the church met as a family, but it so happened they met uh, as families or as, as, as the household of God. They met in residential units, and they met in other places also. Um, and so, but when they did meet, the Bible says they consistently, steadfastly, gave themselves to the doctrine they received from the apostles, because there was no New Testament in those days. The New Testament was only formed in the fourth century. That's why when people say, you know, tithing and first rooting and offerings is redundant, they don't understand. The early church lived through, uh, on, on the word they received from the Old Testament. The 39 books of the Bible was their Bible. Paul never had the New Testament. Peter couldn't say to you, and now I refer you to the first book of Peter. Peter couldn't say that. Uh, Peter had to read the Old Testament and interpret it to the vantage point of his experience with Christ. It was only in the fourth century uh, the New Testament in its various fragments came together and through a filtering process, the, the, the fathers of the church, the apostolic fathers of the church, uh, the United Church, there was one church then it was called the Catholic Church, not Roman, Catholic Church, which later on in 1054 became the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The church split then. There was two groups after that. But in in the fourth century, there was just one church, one leadership over the, the universal church, and, and that church had to make a decision. And they, took, uh, they, they decided that there were 27 writings that should be added to the 39 books of the Old Testament. And that's how we get the New Covenant, the New Testament books of 66, which is now our Bible. Our Bible. And we know that Every single book is fully inspired, old and new. There's no prejudice. And the early church had to learn how to read through the shadows and types and metaphors and riddles and proverbs and prophetic statements and all sorts of stuff in the Old Testament. They had to go through this whole, this whole you know, maze of teachings, this intricate web that hid Christ in the Old Testament, concealed him. They brought him out and shared him uh, in the new covenant. And that's how we have Christ revealed to us through the early apostles. And that's how you got apostles' doctrine, uh, the teachings of the apostles that brought out of the old the spirit of Christ and helped us to understand it in the new covenant. I mean, 
when I first heard my sermons, I didn't want to hear it again. I couldn't believe some of the things I was saying, the errors I made, the, the grammatical errors, the, uh, the bad statements, uh, the way I would preach. But I look back today and listen to the sermons and thank God that he upgraded me. Uh, the way I prayed then is different to the way I pray now. Why? Because as you develop and mature, then your maturity also determines how you communicate. Like in a marriage, when, we, when you first get married, you know, you have to sometimes walk in, on eggshells. The pet cons are too many. It's more than 10 toes. And you don't want to trample on any one of them because, you, you, because two cultures, two worlds are coming together. Um, and it takes time for people to get to know each other. But today, Marol and I can have a mature conversation. We can chat about things and, 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 not, and not be as offensive or misunderstood like we were before. And we could become more composed in the way we communicate. It's called maturation. Maturation. Okay, if you're still fighting each other after 40 years of marriage, then there's a problem there uh, because there should be an upgrade. And, and, and this is the same with prayer. Prayer is, is communication with God. Just imagine you're talking to God and suddenly you, you ignore him and you start talking to the devil. You have another one-hour conversation with the devil and then suddenly you remember God and you, you give a few words and you shift back to the devil. That's what most people do. Most people pray is talking to the devil. But prayer beyond the veil is talking to God. Say to your neighbor, prayer beyond the veil is talking to God. Say to your neighbor, don't bring the devil into your holies of all. Okay? And if the Lord tells you to rebuke him, then you will rebuke him. But you don't bring him into your world, into your spiritual world. And because we're building an, an apostolic house here, uh, it must be a house that is uh, the, the medium between heaven and earth. Uh, if God comes into a place, he must consider our house amongst the many houses in this region. I'm, I'm not saying we're the only house. There must be some very powerful congregations all over Gauteng or in this Santan region, and we respect and salute every one of them. But I'm saying that he must be able to come to our house like he would visit Abraham. He's on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, he's on his way uh, theof theophonically. Uh, that is true. Angels who represent him. Um, he's on his way there, but he can't go to Sodom and Gomorrah without first visiting Abraham and telling Abraham what he is going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah is far away from where Abraham lived. But uh, he must be able to come to our house. And he must be able to share with us things that he's doing, he's going to do in the earth. Uh, that's the kind of church that we have to build. To build that, we have to make sure that the four pillars of our community are in place, which is that this house will always come here with an appetite for apostles' doctrine. And you would not come to this house and expect us to, to water down a message uh, because that's how it should be done on a Sunday because that's how it's done in contemporary circles. Uh, you come here, you have to be hungry for God's word. Yes, we try to make it as simple as possible because we're dealing with all spiritual levels of people and we respect that. But um, to come here, you get doctrine. That's why I devote my time. I, I you know, I, I, it's impossible for me to be a pastor of a local church. Impossible. Uh, some of you um, know how difficult it is to, to access me, and, and, and that's the hard part of choosing to be a part of this congregation because it's not possible. I have a mandate uh, you know, to the nations, uh, to this nation in so many ways, and, and that's not trying to excuse my absence. 
That's the harsh reality. But I make it a point to be here on a Sunday morning as often as I can. As often as I can. It's such a costly thing to do what I do. It costs tens of thousands of rands more. I can just be an itinerant leader. I don't have to lead a local congregation. God gave me an assignment. This house is going to play a big part in the assignment to touch nations. Some of you are going to touch nations. And so I respect God for that. And so I come here to be, to, to share doctrine with you on a Sunday. To share doctrine. And so when we come on a Sunday, we must receive the doctrine. We must receive it. And you must come here with an appetite for the Word of God. And we need to, and doctrine is not just receiving teachings. You have to live by what you receive. It has to be what we call a practical side, a praxis to our doctrine. It must, it must work in your life, and it cannot work in your life if you don't give it permission. It's called the moral or volitional principle. God will never force himself upon you. He'll never force his word upon you. You must create the environment for that word to prosper. It is important, and every one of us in this house must learn how to grow. And secondly, you, can, you must try and keep the bond of the Spirit, which is oneness. People will always be offensive and will offend you. But in this house, we cannot grieve the Holy Spirit. We cannot. I will offend you. My nature, my persona, my personality can be abrasive. That's who I am. I'm telling you this. I've always been naked to this house. When I am wrong, I say sorry. You, I can say sorry. I'm not ashamed to say I made a mistake. That's who I am. I can tell you that you will get hurt. If not by me, by somebody. And you will also hurt somebody. But your offense must not become a stumbling block. Because the stumbling block could become the medium through which God wants to build something. And you rejected it because you thought that it, 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 you know, it was something that hurt you. We cannot allow stumbling blocks in this church. And so don't grieve the bond of the Spirit. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4. We must preserve it. That means protect it, safeguard it. For, you know, just, just, you know, do what I had to learn to do. You know, just if people offend you, offend you, trash it. They tell you some things, just push it aside. Uh, come to a place where you can truly say, that you have no enemies. I learned something many years ago from a preacher. He said, internal strife will always open the door to an external adversary. He said, if you want to have a devil legitimately camp in your house, then allow the spirit of strife to come in. That's what he said. And that thing has stuck with me. I don't want the devil to put his, to camp between my wife and I. I don't want him to come in my neighborhood. I want to greet my neighbor across the fence. I want to go to work and know that the enemy is not camping at the desk next to me or between me. I refuse to let strife or, the, or bitterness you know, bitterness is a very, dis very subtle and discreet root. Most bitter people don't even know they're bitter. It's only later on it manifests, sometimes 20 years later, because bitterness is a root. It starts as a root of bitterness. And, and the ultimate objective of bitterness is to suffocate the grace of Christ. And without the grace of God, you cannot live. You can't play this verbally and politically. And all of this has got to do with a relational culture. That's why the Bible says, if you can't 
forgive others, God will not forgive you. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, forgive me of my sins as I, causative principle, as I forgive others. So if you don't forgive others, don't expect the forgiveness of God. So we must be build, uh, building bridges. We must have the spirit of Shiloh, which is the spirit of a peacemaker. Uh, we don't build walls. We don't create enclaves. Why? Because we want an open heaven. Words that I speak, they are spirit and life. I am the bread from heaven. You can, you can work to buy bread, but the bread that I give you, you can't buy. It comes from heaven. This is what Jesus said. We want food. Food. So, and ultimately, the ultimate is we want nothing. And, you know, the, to go to this dimension called praise, the real dimension called praise, not just some nice, eloquent presentation of, you know, of a verse of statements to God. But to really get to this dimension called praise, it is when you have conquered the flesh. Because to go beyond the veil is to go beyond your flesh. The limitations of your mortality, your humanity, your rationality, your sensuality, to go beyond the dimensions of your humanity, you know, which is corruptible and stained by so many prejudices. And believe me when I tell you, the prejudices of this world so corrupt us. That's where God wants us to. And let me tell you, if we get to this dimension of such engagement, Every house in this place, that's every family here, will have an open heaven over your homes. You can live in the most humble and menial of, uh, of places, but that place will be filled with the cloud of his presence, with his glory. Wherever you are, favor will follow you. The anointing will break yokes of bondage. Captives will be set free. The, the grace of God will just be freely available to the people. It'll just flow. It'll just flow. And, I, and this is what I want. I want this dimension for us. And so I want this to become a house of prayer. A house of prayer. That's what, that, that's it. That's it. And a house of prayer, we may not even spend a lot of time praying. Yes, we will pray. That's why I take time when I step on the stage to pray for you pray for those. And I never pr plan my prayers. I prepare my spirit. I prepare my spirit. I sometimes don't even know what I'm going to do when I step on. But one thing I do know, God told me, bless this house and pray. And we do that as best as we know.